Welcome to a journey through one of the greatest engineering marvels of the modern world, the Panama Canal. Today we will embark on a transit from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, traversing through locks and lakes and witnessing the intricate dance of man and nature. Our journey begins at the Atlantic entrance of the Panama Canal, where ships from around the globe enter this gateway between two oceans. My day began at 6 a.m. on the helicopter pad at the front of the ship on deck four. There was already a gathering of people there when I arrived. We originally were supposed to enter the Gatun locks at 8 a.m., but the night before we were notified, our entry time was pushed back to 10 a.m. It didn't matter. We were still there bright and early to snag a key spot at the bow before the hordes descended later on. At 7 a.m., the ship's photographer came and moved us from the exact center of the bow so he could set up for the photo opportunity offered by the ship. There was some grumbling, but please note that if you do plan on having the exact center of the bow, you won't get it. We sat offshore from Cologne, Panama, where we had been the day before. The ship made circles in the water as we waited for our turn to enter the locks. Please note that it is very windy at the front of the ship. The gentleman standing next to me lost his baseball cap to a quick burst of wind, so make sure your hats are on tight. Finally, at 9.23 a.m., we started to make our move towards the Atlantic Bridge and the Gatun Locks. The first of three bridges we were to go under today, the Atlantic Bridge is the youngest of the three bridges. Constructed from 2013 to 2019, the Atlantic Bridge was built by the French company Vinci Construction. The bridge replaced a ferry that connected the eastern side to the western side and is the only bridge north of the Culebra Cut. 30 minutes later, we were approaching the Gatun Locks where we would wait our turn to enter. The Gatun Locks are a series of three chambers that raise vessels 85 feet above sea level. This process showcases the canal's ingenious system of gravity-fed locks. We will be traversing the original locks during our transit today. It's closing. Closing. The newer and bigger locks, known as the Agua Clara locks, are off to the far left of where we were to enter the original Gatun locks. The Gatun locks consist of two lanes, one heading from the Atlantic to the Pacific and one from the Pacific to the Atlantic, with each lane containing three chambers. Each chamber lifts the ship up 29 feet so that by the time we exit the third chamber into Gatun Lake, we will be 87 feet above where we entered from the Atlantic Ocean. As you prepare to enter the locks, you will see the mules. They don't pull the ship through the locks. Every ship enters the locks under their own propulsion. The mule's purpose is to keep the ship centered within the locks so they aren't scraping the edges of the locks. Mules run along the tracks on both sides of the locks and you will see them along the length of all ships going through the locks. The original Panama Canal, completed in 1914, was designed to accommodate various types of ships within certain size limits. The main types of ships that typically transit the original Panama Canal include container ships, bulk carriers, tankers, such as the one transiting next to us here, passenger ships like our cruise ship, 
and small to medium-sized cargo vessels and pleasure craft. The original Panama Canal has specific size restrictions due to the dimensions of the locks. The dimensions limit the length, width, and depth of ships that can pass through. Because of this reason, they built the new locks, which opened in 2016, so that the larger, more modern ships can transit the canal. But again, we are going through the original locks here. So once a ship has gone through a chamber in the locks, they will need to either fill or release water for it. Since the chamber in front of us is too high with water, that means they will need to release water so that we can enter the chamber. The release mechanism on our side of the locks were under repair. So it looks like they released the water on the other side before they opened the lock for us to enter the chamber. Tired. Hold on. It looks like the edges are going down. Okay. <laughs> it's opening. Oh. Woo! arms down here on here and that'll help to keep you firm and it'll also keep you from being tired. Okay. Oh, it goes inside. We're moving. We, we're moving. I can tell off my left hand side. First time in Los Angeles. First time in Yeah, I, I haven't been there. First time in Los Angeles. It's my port power. I was with one The lock chambers in the original Panama Canal are 110 feet wide by 1,050 feet long, although they limit the length to 1,000 feet for each ship. Each lock chamber requires 26.7 million gallons of water to fill it from the bottom to the top in order to raise the ships, and the same amount must be released to empty the chamber so the ships can descend to the next chamber. The gates holding the water need to be extremely strong to hold all the water and the ships. They measure from 47 to 82 feet high and are 7 feet thick. The tallest gates are on the Pacific side at the Miraflores locks. The heaviest gates are 662 tons. The gates open facing upstream and can only open when the water level on both sides of the gate are equal.
If you want to learn more about the Panama Canal and how it was built, I highly recommend that you read The Path Between the Seas by David McCullough. I'll link to it in the description box below. David, who died in 2022 at age 89, was meticulous in his research, but his writing is engaging and enjoyable to read. I found his book hard to put down, and it's an excellent resource as you plan your Panama Canal cruise. He also narrated an episode of Nova for PBS called A Man, A Plan, A Canal, Panama in 1999. It's brilliant and available to watch for free on YouTube, although the quality isn't that good. I'll link to it in the description box below as well. As I mentioned earlier, it will take eight hours to fully transit the Panama Canal from the Atlantic side to the Pacific side and vice versa. Do not plan on staying in just one place during the transit. You should move around the ship to get other views as you go through it.
By the time we had reached the end of the first set of the Gatun locks, I had been standing at the front of the ship for six hours. I was hot, I needed something to eat, and wanted to sit down, so I returned to the cabin to take some video from that perspective. After going through the Gatun Locks, you will be in Gatun Lake. It was created in 1913 when the United States was ready to dam the Chagres River. By damming the Chagres River and creating Gatun Lake, they were able to allow the ships to cross the Panama Canal at a steady 85 feet. The lake is a freshwater lake and is fed by the rains during the rainy season in Panama. It is also the primary source of drinking water for Colon and Panama City. Lately, due to a significant drought in the area, Gatun Lake had dropped from 87 feet to 81 feet. This led to the first time the canal has ever had to reduce the number of ships transiting the canal. One of the first to be reduced were those cruise ships that were doing only partial transits of the canal. A partial transit is when a ship arrives from California or Florida, goes through the locks to arrive on Gatun Lake, and then returns to their respective states. Only full transit cruises were allowed to complete their transits in 2024, so we were one of the lucky few to be able to transit the Panama Canal this year. As we cross Gatun Lake, you will see a few towns along the way. The first one is Gamboa, and it was built to house employees of the canal along with their families in 1911. Originally settled by silver roll workers who were non-white, it was only used for a few short years until 1914 when the canal was finished. It was rebuilt in 1936 when the dredging division took it over and has been its home ever since. It is still used today and its docks are used to reach the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute located at Barro, Colorado Island. 
So this gigantic crane next to Gamboa is the Titan Crane. It was formerly known as Hermann the German since it was built in 1941 by Hitler's Germany and was claimed by the United States as war booty following the end of World War II. It was dismantled, shipped through the Panama Canal, and served at the Long Beach Naval Yard from 1946 to 1994 when the shipyard was closed. Following the closure of the Naval Yard, it was sold to Panama for one dollar and sent to the Panama Canal to replace two other cranes that had been in use since the canal's opening in 1914. Titan can be floated into the locks and is capable of lifting the gigantic lock doors so they can be serviced every 20 years. As you pass the town of Gamboa and the Titan Crane, you will see two bridges. The bridge closest to the ship is the Gamboa Bridge, and it is crossing the Chagres River. The newer bridge behind it was opened in 2018 and is a much safer and more pleasant drive across the river. Once past the town of Gamboa on the port side, you will see Renesar Prison surrounded by barbed wire. This was where Manuel Noriega, who was the military dictator of Panama from 1983 to 1989, was kept after the U.S. invaded Panama in 1989. Noriega had been working with the CIA as a Central American intelligence source, but he was also a notorious cocaine trafficker. In the end, he was sentenced to prison for drug trafficking, racketeering, money laundering, murder, and human rights violations. He died in 2017. So once you pass the Gamboa Bridge, you will be entering the Culebra Cut. This will be where most of the digging of the Panama Canal occurred. It was also the hardest and most deadly part of the dig. The Culebra Cut is nearly eight miles long from the Chagres River, where the Gamboa Bridge crossed over it that we just passed, to the Pedro Miguel Lock on the Pacific side. The narrowest point is 600 feet wide and the widest is 1,000 feet wide. The French started digging the Culebra Cut on January 22, 1881. It cost many lives due to the French misunderstanding of disease transmittal by mosquitoes. Their failure to finish the canal was partly due to disease, but also underestimating how much effort it was going to take in the excavation and ultimately financial difficulties and collapse. They sold their interest in the canal to the United States in 1904 but they had lowered the summit from 210 feet above sea level down to 194 feet above sea level by the time they handed the canal project over to the Americans. So the Americans took over on May 4, 1904. At the time of purchase, the French were planning on digging a canal that would be sea level with no lock system in place. The Americans changed that plan to include locks, thus negating the need to excavate as deep as the French had initially planned. 
The Americans also benefited in huge technological advances in excavation over what the French had just 20 years prior. The biggest challenge in the Culebra Cut was landslides. In time, the Americans were able to overcome the challenge, and on May 20, 1913, steam shovels broke through the cut. They had lowered the summit from 194 feet above sea level to 39 feet above sea level, and had widened the cut along with it, making it less steep, which was the solution to the landslides. This giant hill is Gold Hill. This is the highest point in the Culebra Cut, rising 662 feet above sea level. This gives you a sense of just how much digging took place in order to excavate the Panama Canal. This area took the most digging and it crosses the Continental Divide. On the starboard side, the hill is called Contractor's Hill with an elevation of 335 feet above sea level, although I couldn't see it from my cabin on the port side. These were the two hills that caused most of the landslide problems and are still monitored to this day. The terraces that you see are part of the solution in maintaining the hill and keeping it from causing more landslides. The second bridge we are going under here on the canal is the Centennial Bridge. It's a relatively young bridge having been built in 2004 to help supplement the overcrowded Bridge of the Americas that we'll be sailing under after we go through our last set of locks and before we enter the Pacific Ocean later tonight. It's located a little over nine miles from the Bridge of the Americas, but it felt a lot longer since we still had to go through the Pedro Miguel locks and the Miraflores locks. Notice the dock area beneath the bridge. This is an area where ships can wait to go under the bridge if another ship is heading towards it. It's also used as an emergency dock.
The bridge was named the Centennial Bridge in honor of Panama's Centennial, which was November 3, 2003. With an extremely short 29-month building timeline, it was hoped that the bridge would be completed in time for the 90th anniversary of the first ship transit of the Panama Canal back on August 15, 1914. It was indeed inaugurated on August 15, 2014 in time for that anniversary, although it didn't actually open for traffic until September 2, 2005 because the highways leading to it weren't finished on time. The bridge is a cable stayed design with a total span of 3,451 feet and it clears the canal by 260 feet so the tallest of ships can easily sail below it. It was also built to withstand earthquakes which are common in the area, although the road access to it has been impeded in the past due to flooding and heavy rains. We've reached the San Miguel Lock. It has only one chamber in each lane for the ships passing through. This chamber allowed the ship to drop down 29 feet from Gatun Lake to Miraflores Lake. I think we spent some time waiting within Miraflores Lake before we were able to go through the Miraflores locks. I was unable to get any video of our going through those locks since we were at dinner and not next to the window, but I did notice when we were passing through it. By the time dinner was finished, it was dark outside and we were on our way to finish our full transit of the Panama Canal. We eventually were close enough to Panama City that we were able to see the city lights from the top deck of the ship. I went a few decks higher than I had been first thing in the morning to get a different view and I'm glad that I did. We passed by the Port of Balboa which was built in 1909 and is the only container terminal for Panama servicing the Pacific region, although they are working on expanding it on the other side of the waterway. Our last bridge to sail under was the Bridge of the Americas. Built in 1962, it allows the Pan American Highway to connect directly with Panama City. It was the only drivable means of crossing from North to South America until the Centennial Bridge was built in 2004.
Clearance under the bridge is 201 feet at high tide, but this still isn't high enough for some of the largest ships at sea to sail under it in order to use the new locks of the Panama Canal. The Panama Canal stands not only as a testament to human ingenuity, but also as a symbol of connectivity between continents, allowing ships to save thousands of miles and weeks of travel time. As we conclude our journey, we reflect on the beauty and significance of this remarkable waterway. After a journey spanning approximately 50 miles and taking us nearly 12 hours, we have successfully traversed the Panama Canal from the Atlantic to the Pacific. I hope you've enjoyed this video showcasing the Panama Canal. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so you can be notified when I drop my next video. Our next stop will be Puerto Quetzal in Guatemala, and if you haven't heard of it, well, neither had we until this cruise, and we ended up really enjoying our time there. Thanks for watching.